Thank you and welcome to the first event. It gives me huge pleasure to welcome to the first and sold out event for the Future Curators Programme. I'm Aidan Mosby and I will be hosting this and the next two events in the series Exploring Institutional Change. For today's event, we have an amazing lineup of Deborah Kamod from Matt Birmingham, freelance artist and curator Ashok Kumar Mystery, and from the welcome Teresa Cisneros. But first, a brief context and some housekeeping. The Future Curators Programme supports deaf and disabled curators to develop their skills and expertise through residencies within organisations. Through the programme, we aim to change the culture of the visual arts sector so it becomes more inclusive and accessible to disabled people. Since 2018, DASH has worked with partners, MAC, Midlands Arts Centre in Birmingham, MIMA, Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, and Wising Arts Centre in Cambridge to develop the Future Curators programme. Today's session, Rocking the Boat, is the first in a series of three events about curating institutional change. Just to be aware that this session is being recorded and will be available afterwards. We have British Sign Language provided by Rachel Radford. We also have live captioning by Nicola Dutton and captions can be turned on or off by pressing the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can access the captions in your browser if you prefer, if you press the link that's in the chat. And we're really keen to get your questions in for the panel. So please use the Q&A box to post your questions, not the chat function but feel free to use the chat to interact with your fellow attendees. It would be nice to get a sense of who's in the room so we can encourage you to post your name, role, organization if you're attached to one in the chat. Again, this is located in the bottom of your Zoom window. I will pose as many of your questions as I can to the panel towards the end of the discussion. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to respond to the provocation in turn for five minutes and then that will be followed by some questions from me and then we'll open it up to the floor and close things around 25 past two. It would be great if you could also take the time to fill out the feedback form. So today we are exploring rocking the boat, externally driven change. How can we create, encourage and embed a process of meaningful transformation? And to start us off, we have Deb Kamod from Mac. Hello everybody, um, I'm going to give a brief audio description of myself now. I am a small white woman with blonde hair and a fabulously orange cotton top that I'm wearing today. I want to thank Aidan for inviting me to speak today. It's just wonderful to be able to think strategically about art again and not COVID or health and safety regulations in a big building. So thank you very much Aidan. Today, I am speaking from the perspective of an arts professional that leads a large scale arts organization. So the big question we're asking ourselves right now is, how will our world change after the global pandemic? Will we completely go back to the normal and try to forget what has happened? Will we change a few habits, policies and plans to confront perhaps an uncertain future? Or will we go a bit further and make bigger reforms we once thought impossible but now seem feasible and urgent. Like many of you attending today, possibly, I am still operating on survival mode. There were times during the past year that I genuinely thought the organization I lead may close entirely. And I still need time to mentally process the supercharged sense of urgency I've been feeling for 15 months. However, one thing I am certain of is that we have to, we have the chance to recalibrate our organizations, our own practice and thinking. So for me, this is a truly unique and strategic opportunity to make further changes. Now, I have some observations to make. Remember, this is through my experience as an arts director. My first observation is the mainstream cultural sector need to wake up. The experiences of all artists, but particularly those 
that identifies disabled artists are pivotal and more urgent than ever. Disabled artists have been disproportionately hit hardest by COVID and we need to take action. We need to prioritize disabled artists, not always through the guise of disability arts, but through the way that artists are intrinsically valued by the quality of their work. Many artists, as we know, deliberately decide not to mention their disability or their lived experience as part of their work because they believe that they could be excluded from or there may be discrimination against their participation in mainstream arts. Some artists may not choose to be part of specialist networks or disability-led organisation, so it is incumbent on arts professionals such as myself to actively seek out new talent, promote graduates, and really importantly, continue to support older artists. We have an obsession in the arts with emerging talent. We need to be able to carry through all those relationships at every different time in an artist's life. We do not wait for artists to call us, we need to be proactive. And a very quick example of that, Mac is about to issue an open call for a new paid two-year associate programme that supports career development. We're doing it now because we want to give the opportunity to somebody who needs it quickly. Um, and we want to learn from them and share their thinking straight away. So that's really important to us. But I've challenged my HR team and all the teams to find new ways to find those artists because they may not be in the usual network. So I'm challenging internally my own teams. How can we find new artists who are making fabulous work, but just not on that radar? It's also important that we give disabled artists the opportunity to comment on a range of issues, not just related to the lived experience. Could be feminism, racism, it could be climate crisis, a whole range of different things, okay? That again is incredibly important. And we also have to look at the granular experience of disabled artists. So again, very quick example, we're hosting the Birmingham Indian Film Festival. We were very keen to look at disability through that global perspective. And we have a film uh, that we're screening in a few weeks time about racism within the deaf community in, um, in Calcutta. So that's really important. We've got the director of the film talking about why she made that film and we'll have that obviously with BSL, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important to get into the granule of that experience. My second point, hang on, is that we've witnessed the incredible call to arms that many organizations have provided support to black artists in the past year. And the agency that has been in, engaged with race has been very powerful. The focus, this kind of real, you know, very important stringent work needs to be extended to disabled artists. Now, my second point is about issues of resources. Everyone has money in an arts organization, okay? It's simply what you decide to spend on it. So all arts organizations decide on how to allocate the resources, budget, staffing. One thing I cannot abide is hearing from arts directors and how they need a special grant or a special fund to support specialist work. Or their perception is that they need specialist staff. I think this sense of waiting until the perfect working condition hinders many of them from just getting on with it. There is often a lack, a simple lack of the joy of experimentation. Take those artists on that new journey with you. Don't wait for this important pot of money to arrive. So one thing we do at Mac- Can you some of that, please? Oh, yep. Um, have critical friends, that's very important. Public participation is crucial and make strategy sexy. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, but I know that som sometimes we all get carried away and it can just expand, but, but there's been plenty of time to come back to, to raise those points in the conversation, Deb. So thank you for that. Sounds like you're calling for a revolution. You'll, you'll be getting taken off the board. 
<laughs> thank you. Thanks, Aidan. Thank you, Deb. So I don't know how Ashok is going to follow that, but let's see. So over to you, Ashok Kumar Mystery. Hi, I've got a little presentation, just a few slides. Uh, can you see that? Fantastic. So um, I'm a brown graying male, clean shaven, wearing a black t-shirt. I usually wear glasses, but I can't find them at the moment. So please bear with me. Um, I have been working as an artist for over 20 years and as an activist exploring disability for around five years. It, um, disability was more of an epiphany for me because it's an invisible disability. Um, I've been one of the co-evaluators for Dash's Curatorial Commissions project and I'm currently an associate artist with Disability Arts Online and an associate writer with um, International Association for Art Critics and a development artist with Spark Arts. I actively identify as disabled with and, and argue that my ADHD and dyslexia are the catalyst for my creativity. I've chosen this painting of mine titled The Cane Cutters because it depicts the relationship between outsiders and the mainstream um, uh, society through a cultural act. The group of cane, this group of cane cutters is from a particular tribe and despite them performing this act of blessing, they are still considered as low caste and to be feared. Oops. Okay. Um, the Hindi word Okad always comes to mind when, I, uh, when I'm involved in debates about inclusiveness uh, in the arts. It refers to one station or place in society. It is a highly discriminatory term drenched in privilege. I mention it because it always reminds me of how disability is considered within the sphere, the sphere of arts. I was discussing digitally created art and its importance to dis disabled artists to a prominent figure from the art world recently. They told me that as they saw things, for most people, disability was considered as an extremely negative state of being. And remember, this, these are the words of this individual, not mine. Dis disability was considered as just one step away from death. It's sad that this individual considered disability from such a negative perspective. It connects back to attitudes towards disability that took hold in the early part of the last century, following the, following the rise of eugenics. There has been a history of trying to hide or exterminate disabled, um, deaf and disabled people historically. Um, historically, people with disabilities were left to die. During the Second World War, around 200,000 dis disabled people were murdered by the Nazi regime between 1940 and 1945, and yet we he rarely hear the statistic. There's, there's a little fascist in us all, burrowing away at our thoughts to gain purchase on our emotions. Most of the time, we don't even realise this fascist is there. It hides behind our arrogance to make us look like we're not discriminating when we obviously are. We want to distinguish ourselves from other people. We want to stand away from the perceived riffraff. Most of the, these words we use are innocu innocuous, um, but hold sway during converse conversations around worthiness. In the arts, contemporary is a classic example of an other, otherwise innocuous word born of policy that builds prejudice. Problems arise from the values we ascribe to the word. Who is a contemporary artist? Close your eyes and think of an archetypal contemporary artist or curator for that matter. Think about it. What was this contemporary artist? Uh, sorry, was this contemporary artist in your mind's eye disabled or curator for that matter? A, a contemporary artist is meant to mean an artist of now. However, it has actually come to define the types of artists that don't fit its mould. And most worryingly, it is used to refuse access to those artists. This is evidenced by membership criteria for arts organisations in curating policy and responses that disabled artists and artists of colour get when approaching institutions. 
Whenever I've approached galleries, I've never, sorry, when I've approached galleries, they've never given a reason for their disapproval of my work, but instead they always redirect me to the same diversity led organizations. My provocation is this, can the removal of words like contemporary make curatorial vocabulary more inclusive? Thanks, Ashok. That was uh, that was perfectly timed. Fantastic. Thanks. So now over to the uh, final contributor this afternoon, Teresa Cisneros from Welcome. Teresa. Hello. Um, I am a person with large black glasses. As I'm a nervous presenter, I will not be showing you a PowerPoint, nor will I make jokes or attempt zoom eye contact. I will read directly from the script. I am comfortable in conversations, so look forward to that. I want to quickly thank Aiden for inviting me to this panel and also thank the panelists as well as attendees for sharing this space with me. Now, my name is Teresa Cisneros, the daughter of Vicente Cisneros and Lucrecia Puente, both of Mexican heritage. I am a Chicana or Mexican-American from La Frontera or the Mexico-Texas border. I practice from where I am from, not where I am at. My politics and ways of being were grown here and I continue to embody the border space in how I practice in the UK. Where I come from, we practice in collectivity. There's never a solo person doing or thinking on their own. Where I come from, we practice a way of being that can be summed up as, if you are okay, then I am okay. I state this so you don't have to guess where I am from. I would rather let you know who I am and how I practice. I was asked to respond to the theme of the event today in a few minutes. What I wish I could do is tell you how I arrived at doing what I do, because in my current role, I am called inclusive practice lead at the Welcome Collection. This means that I practice inclusion in how I work and lead the thinking on this. It's an odd title and an odd way of thinking and how or who we include. I just want to share this with you that before being in this role, I was a curator of objects or of artists, but I no longer felt the curating objects was good enough for me. I became more interested in what is meant, what it meant to curate people, to administrate their lives through an institution, what it means to rethink institution, to reconstruct it in more caring, but also in more caring ways, but also how to use policy and internal staff practices to create more just spaces and address what I call bad behaviors. I think about how to challenge normative structures. I take this back to the idea that all institutions are part of a colonial structure that was, was not designed for someone like me. If I start with this logic, by the, way, I by the way, I studied philosophy, then arts administration, so I am well versed in colonial administration. I use its logic against itself. I know the language and the power of policymaking, but I also know that coloniality is thriving in all our structures, that unless we begin to think of our institutions as systems that create oppression, then we will never begin to actually face the real issues at hand. Because the majority of us have been socialized and educated to recreate a colonial system that excludes all but one piece. However, I like to think that each one of us is an institution of and in ourselves. I don't think about creating models for change because once something becomes a model, it has been co-opted and therefore no longer useful. I am of the mindset that everything is in process and is an experiment. For one institution may not work for another, but learning how, but learning how it can be shared and adapted. I like the idea that models are temporary and we take what we need and use them until they are no longer useful. Adapting ourselves to situations is useful. This leads me to think that about the idea that institutions are fearful or resisting change. Let's remember that institutions are made up of people like you and me, who have a passion, who want to earn a living, who want to try their best, who want to be relevant, who want to have a nice place to live, who want to be seen to do the right thing. These are the institutions. And I guess, yes, they have a right to be fearful and resist and want, uh, fearful of resisting change because many people in positions of power are afraid to admit they do not know. They're afraid to look like they do not know. There is shame in not knowing but also there is desire to hold on to power. If we, cre we create change, these would require for, these peop for some of these people whose practices are no longer relevant to have to leave institutions, but how many years will it take to do that or for them to admittedly leave on their own terms? Meaningful transformation can only happen 
when all staff in an institution trust the change, trust the leadership, or trust those the institution has entrusted to create that change. I have been at Welcome now two and a half years, and at that time, I have persuaded, lobbied, convinced. I have been an amazing politician to get my colleagues to trust me to develop a meaningful approach to inclusion. I designed a learning framework called the Social Justice Curriculum, where all staff have to take essential anti-racism and anti-ableism modules over eight weeks as continuing developing practices. This amounts to about 30 hours of learning. I was able to make the case by using data about our staff, their needs and their fears, about not knowing if they were doing the right things around inclusion. My approach was to listen to staff, work with external collaborators and experts, and then put forward something that I would also like to learn through. As I like to say, if an institution wants you to change, then they need to teach you how to make the change. They need to invest in you. Part of my work is to create spaces for re-educating and addressing our bad behaviors and practices through real change over a sustained period of time, not a one-off workshop or some sessions on unconscious bias training. We must learn where we have been, where we are and where we want to go to, but also to remember that in this learning, we are we will also have to give up some of our old ways of being, not just because it's a moral issue, but because it's an issue of being relevant and surviving in contemporary times. That's it, Aiden, thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, that's an awful lot packed into five minutes. <laughs> we could spend the next, well, yeah, we could spend a lot of time unpacking that density. But I think there's, um, for me, I, I, the thing that's coming first to mind is about culture so and agency and power. So Deb is a CEO of an organization and calling for, for revolution. And, and it, but also you were talking, uh, Teresa, about, about the culture of an organization and about change. And I'm just wondering um, to all three panelists about when, it be, when a culture becomes embedded and a person stays at the top so long and where does that um so where does that change come from sometimes it can change come from the bottom up or the top down and i'm just wondering about with your role Teresa, in initiating that change and the agency and power you have in your role and deb's role as a, a as a ceo kind of so different kind of status and then yeah and then where does the art as curator fit into that I guess with Ashok so could you talk to that for a few minutes please I don't know who wants to start and I'm, I'm going to start if that's okay um, yeah, great thank you um I went to say that I'm on a three-year contract and before I arrived at the welcome collection they were already starting to plan um, a five-year program of access diversity and inclusion so we have a strategic direction and I also have to be clear that the Welcome Collection is well resourced. We are part of the Welcome Trust. So we have um, significant budgets to put towards change, culture change, um, programming, et cetera. So we, I'm actually working from a very privileged position with this type of institution. I think it's important for me to be honest and declare that as well. So I was brought in on this three-year contract. The strategic direction focuses on access, to, um, I'm sorry, ensuring that we work with deaf, disabled, neurodivergent, and racially minoritized communities. So we have a very specific mandate. And I think when I entered, there was a will or a want or desire for change. However, it was they didn't know what or what it would look like. And I think I created a very different approach to what they were thinking. I think they thought maybe I was going to bring in some workshops, very kind of superficial work, which is always what happens in most institutions. And I actually turned it around and I did a big piece of research called Person-Centered for Design, Person -Centered Design for Inclusive Practices, which was a four month piece of deep research with 10% of our staff to really find out why, why if we were well-meaning, well-intentioned, good university educated, well-meaning, good people, were we still so exclusively white and non-disabled? So I wanted to ask, what, why? And I think this is something most institutions don't do because they're afraid to find out the reasons why. And what we found out were things about barriers, but also what they were afraid of. So it becomes an emotional piece of work as well. So as much change as we're trying to think about, unless we grapple with the fact that we're actually asking for behavioral change, which is 
real people's beingness, then an institution will be here again and again. So I think for me that this is what I propose to the welcome. And I think they kind of were taken aback, but also were curious about a different type of approach that um, if I'm honest, I haven't seen any like anything like that in any institution. And also it allowed me to then propose the social justice curriculum, which is a, a very extensive curriculum that goes over a year. But again, I want to remind everyone that this is, um, we're able to do this because of our funding. And you're right, Deb, when you say that there's always money and you're right, there's always money. It's just about how you redistribute it within what you're gonna spend it on. So I'm gonna stop there. Thanks, Teresa. Where do I sign up for this? <laughs> One of the things that just came to mind there about the culture, and I'm gonna to come to you, Debs, next, is um, thinking about, you know, you instill this change or you want to instill that change. And then, so you get maybe some disabled people into work with you or for you. But actually, if we're not reflected in the culture of the organization, what do I have invested in, in, that, in staying in that organization if I'm not welcomed, if I'm not embedded? And, you know, yeah. So I think that this, it's, it's getting minorities in is one thing, to use a crude term, but retaining them is a totally different aspect. Thanks, Teresa. So Debs. That's great. Teresa, that's really fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, I suppose at Mac, before COVID hit, we had 200, I think about 200 people on our payroll. So we're fairly ch chunky, you know, workforce. And I think the most important thing is that you trying to create um, a culture of well-being for the organization, you know, and this was prior to COVID, I really thought about that. Um, it was inclusive, but, it, but you have to think holistically about the organization you run and you are, uh, and the care of those uh, colleagues that you work with. So that, that's the first thing to say. And that feels even more important now than ever before. Um, so you have to create a culture of openness and appreciation actually of all the different um, uh, ways that people work, the way that they learn. Um, some people learn and act very differently to others and you have to find ways both formal and informal to ensure that their voice is heard. I think that's one of the most difficult things. You can't just sort of on a practical level have a meeting after meeting because for some people some staff some colleagues it just that's not the right environment so I think certainly for me it was trying to over the five years I've been there five years this summer at MAC that time has been spent nurturing the staff and helping them to have that critical voice to be a critical friend um, and to have the opportunity and that's also at board level um, and so I would say that it's, it's an attitude, a positive attitude, as much as anything that you're trying to um, work with so that people can feel able to offer and, and feel heard and feel listened to. And there's, you know, and there's mechanisms to do that. Thanks. One of the... Uh things that seems to be coming through is is about care and you know I don't want to get too much into care because coincidentally that's the subject of next week's panel but I think it really is important but but this care and this listening and um yeah so it, it's good that you know that as a you know, head of an organization that you're that you're putting that at the front as well um Ashok do you have a response to, to this? Yeah, um, there's a couple of things that was uh, rattling through my mind. I mean, you mentioned care, but again, what is that care for? Um, what is the change for? What's the motive behind the change? And that's really important. I mean, we, uh, a parallel to the arts is like the climate crisis, as you would know, having kind of explored it through your work. But... Um, <clears throat> Um, for years we've had this attitude of um, kind of um, doing a patch-up job so um, when we look at the kind of changes that were that were being offered it was always about 
Um, the motive was about still enabling us to do the things that we want to do. So the, the, um, um, the motive of the change wasn't to actually stop the, the harm that was happening. It was more about um, doing something else somewhere else, you know, fiddling with something um, like carbon capture is a, a classic one where carbon capture is actually used to enable us just to keep using our motor cars all the time, you know, so we'll catch some carbon here, but let's just keep using our cars. And it's the same in the arts. We'll, we'll put a little patch in here, but then it'll, it'll, uh, we won't actually kind of um, explore or attack some of the privilege that's actually built into the system. And, and that, that's one of the things that we really need to look at is what's the motive for the change? Are we actually looking for a sustainable change or are we looking for just patches? And also, um, what, are, what, are, what do we expect of the people coming into this situation of change? Are we expecting them to mould themselves to, this, to the situation of the institution? Or do we want them to flourish as they are? You know, we, as Dash calls them, we have a lot of awkward bastards like me. Um, and um, I'm proud to be one, by the way. Um, and uh, but how do these people, how do us awkward bastards, for want of a better phrase, um, how do we function in such a rigid space? You know, can the change actually enable us or will it stifle us? Does anybody want to come back on that? I, um, I, Ash, I'd like to just respond to something that, um, we've been working on at The Welcome, which is about, um, it's called Principles for Working Together. And instead of us assuming what you or anybody else might need, we actually ask what you might need. What is it that you need? Mm -hmm. On what conditions do you want to work with us? So then the, it becomes kind of a tool for negotiation between the external collaborator and the institution because we recognize that we actually have all the power because we do. And in terms of just the institution, especially with external collaborators. So this is a, a, piece, a policy document. And you know, this is where I talk about administration and how you can use policy against the institution itself. Um, and it's about um, risk management and harm reduction. I'm really interested in how with administration, we can reduce harm of those that work with us and those who will work with us externally. So what it acts is before you sign any deliverables contract with the commission or as an external curator, you're literally given this form and you're told, look, please let us know how, what we can do to ensure you have a positive, safe, happy experience and the environment we create and the conditions we create are suitable for you. And they would say, we will try because, because of litigation purposes, we can't say we're going to do because we can never provide, we can't get rid of all barriers. We can attempt to reduce barriers. So I'm really interested in this idea of asking people versus assuming what people need. Because I think every institution does this. When you go for a job interview, no one ever asks you, what do you need? What would you like? What would make you feel good to work with us? And I think if we turn these power dynamics a little bit differently, you thought, for me, that's an institution at least temporarily showing care or if it's for the six months that you're with us. But ultimately, it gives you a voice that most people don't have. It's a negotiating power. And I developed this with 25 people from different teams and also with two GDPR lawyers and a legal contracts lawyer and an ethics lawyer. So it's a document that's quite sound and I'm really happy to share it if anybody would like to have it. There's something similar that um, a group of artists developed called uh, Access Docs for Artists. You must have come across this. It was developed by a group of artists um, uh, uh, during a residency at the Wising Art Centre. Um, and it's fantastic. I use it myself and I encourage other artists to use it. But essentially, it's like a rider. Um, but the problem that a lot of artists have, especially neurodivergent artists, is you don't understand the difference between yourself and the world around you. And you can kind of guess 
but sometimes it's only through trial and error or kind of talking to other people that you can actually understand some of the barriers that you face. Um, you don't actually understand them until you actually get there. So we need more kind of um, um, kind of open situations where uh, and more forgiveness as well for things you know to go wrong because arts is all about taking risks at the end of the day. I was going to say, Ash, so one of the parts of this um, agreement that we do is that you don't have to sign up to it immediately, but you can return to it at any point. But we also ha have it open because we know artist circumstances change in the middle of commissions or projects or with curators or external collaborators. There's no assumption that it, because we say it's going to happen like that, it's going to happen. We're all humans, you know, and I think it also, our document is around, it, it, it's it centers access and support, but inclusion. But for me, the term access is about how do you access the institution? It's not just about a disability or somebody who might not ha actually know they might have a disability, say they might have dyslexia and they don't know it, but they know that they need documents in a certain way, but they've never been given the diagnosis. So it allows for that um, just difference, I think, of who we are as humans. So it'd be great to chat, chat again, Ash, after this. Just um, thanks for that. Um, but also, I just want to remind people to get the, um, some questions into the Q&A. And before we go to the questions from the Q&A from the audience, I just want to pick up on what uh, Deb said a bit earlier about changing the way that the organisation works, about like working with different people, working with older, older emerging artists and, you know, kind of shaking the boat from that. And how do you... Like how do you go about that? Why do you want to do it? And how do you sell it as an I, you know, because it's not the traditional, it's not the, tr the way that the traditional arts work, is it? It's like, you know, you want, people tend to work with the same people. Yeah. Can I, I come think oh, Shall I stop? No, I just sorry, think it's really, sorry. Go on, I Deb. just think it's quite boring to work with the same people. I mean, that's, you know, the sim simplicity of it. I th the older artist thing, and um, and I'm not connecting that with my own age, can I say, but it is interesting, as an, art an artist gets older, they tend to be invited to do retrospectives. They seldom get asked, and I'm talking much older, I'm talking sort of 70s and 80s, when we're talking right the way through their career. Um, and like all artists, they may have not had that same trajectory all the way through. And I've always been really interested in older artists and how we can give them an opportunity, particularly if they were seen to do quite radical work in their younger days, how, what, what their sense of themselves and the world they live in and, and, and what they can teach and talk to us about today. So older artists is actually embedded in our business plan now. And we commission artists every year to work with us. And that comes with a whole range of different issues. We work with someone who, um, you know, with their health, their mobility, all sorts of things. And, um, and across the board, of course, because we're not centered, it's dance, theater, film, etc. So it's really interesting for us. And also the population's getting older. So as in, they are still enjoying, uh, well, they will always continue to enjoy their cultural experiences. And, and when you come into a public space, you should be able to see yourself on the stage and the walls and the screen. Um, and that's really important. The art doesn't belong just to the young or to younger ideas. And so that's just a, a particular push of our artistic plan um, is that we, we want to give that opportunity. See what happens. I, I like that idea that it's like, you know, the proactive looking rather than, you know, the, than the traditional. We've got a, a question here from, from Gaia Redgrave to you, Debs. I like to hear that curators and organisations need to be proactive in finding disabled, marginalised artists. What is your plan slash strategy to do this? And how can you encourage others to follow in your footsteps? I think, I mean, the, again, this is where if you have a collegiate team you ask across your teams that's the most important thing you talk internally you find um or you identify lots of different often non-art communities 
and networks and um, connections. That's really important because I think it's something Teresa said earlier, which is not everyone thinks of themselves as an artist. And uh, that's really important to be able to connect with people who may not realize what they're doing is interesting, the work that they make, how they make the work. So we, we work to a whole range of different community uh, groups. We put at our, on socials, we always ask our audiences for advice. You know, where do we go? How can we, how can you help us? We have a very, very passionate, loyal following at MAC and they will, will extend their thoughts on this. We talk to agencies and charities. We talk to education and faith groups. So we're really determined to get that message out as far as possible. We haven't cracked it entirely, I'm sure, but certainly it's something um, that we're very keen to do just because we really do want to encourage as many people as possible to feel that they um, that they can talk to us or they can respond, work with us in any way they can. And how do you encourage other organisations to follow your lead? You know what, I'm not a big believer. Maybe it's, I don't know, my age or my class, but I'm not very good at calling people out publicly. It's not something I enjoy and I don't like it actually for myself. And so, but I often have a little conversation with other people in the sector and encourage them to be more open if they can. So I think that's the way I tend to mobilize my influence, if I can call it that, which is trying to encourage others to be more collaborative and to enjoy the idea and to bring them on that journey with you. I do see that as part of my role actually um, in the arts. But I, but I don't do that on Twitter or anything like that. I would be much more thoughtful and use the word caring again to think about that. Thanks, Deb. So a question from Mike Laywood to Teresa. It was great to hear the word collective. How can we begin to change the competitive arts pyramid where the success of 1% is built on the 99% to a more collective approach? How long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's the way we're educated, right? I mean, it all goes back to education. And I think this is part of the challenge is that so many of us are sat and have been educated and nurtured to think in a certain way of success. So I think if we change the model of what we think success is, it changes the way we start thinking about who takes part in how we behave and who we behave with. I think for me, I don't do anything alone ever. Every decision I make is based on the decisions of various people. I am somebody who is very, part of it is also letting go of your ego, right? Um, we are conditioned to think that it can only be one curator, one this, one that, one director. Why are we still stuck in this ideology? But it's a very kind of white European way of thinking of power and colonialism. I come from the border where, you know, anything we do, there might be 10, 15, 20 people making the decision to do it in one way or not, you know, one votes out, that's it, we don't do it. So we aren't accustomed to behaving like this. And I think there is something about when you're able to let go of this kind of ego driven, um, everybody wants to be famous, everybody wants to be Insta famous, Twitter famous, then you kind of enter a new space of like how you can both give and receive. So um, I don't think everyone knows how to. Um, it takes years of being in these situations because I think there's collectivity and there's collaboration too that's kind of go hand in hand. And, a lot of people talk about collaboration, especially when we're talking around inclusivity and let's collaborate with this community group, which is let's bring in the brown, the black, the disabled people temporarily, but let's not give them any power. The power is still held by the institution. It's usually by white non-disabled people and they're middle class, let's face it. So for me, it's about, if you really wanna work in true collaboration, you have to let go of some of these things. For me, I think there are things about maybe people shouldn't be in their jobs for longer than three to four years. You know, that there should be a turnover and that, you know, why have one director when you can have five directors? Why are some people paid 75,000 pounds and some people 20,000 pounds? I mean, there are these discrepancies that still allow us to behave this way. And I think, you know, it's going to take a long time for people to give this up, right? Because it's power and money. That's yeah. the heart of this kind of like single mindedness. And someone like me, I have to say is I've moved around to various positions. I'm not from this country, but I'm also... I'm also not above working at a place like McDonald's, right? Or cleaning toilets. Well, I think a lot of my colleagues 
would never take a job like that. For me, money is money. And I think there is, when you let go of some of these things, it allows you to be more collective, I think. So I think it's just institutions have to rethink how they structure themselves. If anybody from the Arts Council is here, since I think most of us are probably funded by the Arts Council, the Arts Council has a lot to answer to or for in terms of how we're y'all are funded and the conditions they create for how you're funded because it creates the excellence, the, the youth, the young people, that kind of thing, which then creates this single-mindedness. I think that, I hope I kind of answered it. If not, sorry, but. No, brilliant. I mean, you're throwing up far more. Yeah, it's fantastic. Thank you. I imagine you want to come back on that, Ashok, about the 99% maybe. You'll have to put your microphone on. Maybe not the 99%. I, I guess it does fit there as well. Um, there was a piece of um, research that um, uh, came through, for, I think it was from either MIT or Stanford. It was called um, Who Becomes an Inventor in America? And one of the um, kind of key points was, was that um, they found that there were loads of lot, what they referred to as lost Einsteins. So there were people who were clever enough, but because of the way we actually kind of uh, goad people into um, into uh, a very kind of institutional mindset or the way we value people, val value certain people over others. And some people might have um, uh, be on the autistic spectrum or whatever. They are held back from contributing to society. And what you have is a situation where we all lose out when they don't get an opportunity. And it's the same sort of thing in the arts. We're, we're all losing out culturally because some voices aren't being heard. And that's a real problem. And it kind of relates back to your um, question about um, older people coming into the, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, moving away from this fixation of, of youth and emerging talent and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I can go on, but I won't. Thank you. So in, next up, we've got a question from Ayan Selmi. I hope I've got the pronunciation right. Are institutions capitalist in their way of working? By that, I mean the expectation of artists is working over and above the monetary reward. How do we shift this expectation? Does anybody want to take that? Go on, Ashok. We come back to our old friend policy we have seen that change, that political change influencing um, kind of culture uh, and so on. And it's, and it's been happening since kind of around 2010, I think it was, uh, where you've seen a shift from um, the old British model of um, the arts, which is very much to do with um, the state funding the arts that can't otherwise happen to a more philanthropic model that, that you know, from the United States where um, uh, it's up to kind of trusts and foundations to kind of, to fund the arts. And I think um, it kind of encourages this kind of capitalist attitude where um, the arts are seen as kind of, um, um, what's that word? Um, a kind of a hobby or a kind of like a pastime for certain people so uh, whereas what we really need to do is we really need to see art as more of a necessity it's part yeah. of our and we've seen that through the pandemic how much how important it actually is how important culture actually is it's not this kind of pa pastime for the rich and famous it's it's for everyone one thing that we really need to understand is how we got to this point Art has been with us um, as human beings since, you know, we emerged from wherever we emerged from. And it's slowly been taken away from us. When you look at kind of um, the way um, a lot of community arts was funded um, and was cut back in, I think it was a, that was around 2010. And we went to this kind of contemporary model for the arts and so on and so forth. What you essentially had was a situation where the arts was being taken away from us. And then um, as soon as we forgot what that art was, it was then being repackaged and sold back to us. And it's that the same scenario. 
you, thanks, Ashok. Do you, do you want to come in on that one, Deb? Therese is with a hand up. Let me pass it. I just to wanted to say something. I want to remind us that art is not just made in galleries, that art is made and culture is made in everything from the church to the home to your friends together. And that not all art has to be state funded. And then not all art has to take place in what are constituted as art spaces, because that is such a white European way of thinking of culture. And this is part of the conditions that we are under and we've been conditioned to believe in. So I need to remind, I just needed to say that because I don't agree with the idea that the state has to do everything either. Mm -hmm. now, I mean, I know it's not my role today to, to, to come back on that, but I'm just thinking about, you know, the, the that we still need to put food on the table and as marginalized, uh, I don't want to speak for Ashok, but certainly as a marginalized artist, you know, that the opportunities are fewer and that, you know, our, the funding models are, are, are different or what we rely on is, is more limited. So I guess, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's it's as binary as kind of one or the other. I think, yeah, as you say, art is everywhere. But what we really need to understand is um, how we value that art and how we actually, I mean, the amount of times that I've been asked to do stuff for free, you know, if I had been paid for a lot of that, I wouldn't be having this conversation right now. You know, I wouldn't be in, in um, a situation where I'd have to talk about margin, marginalization. Could we not afford you, Ashok? <laughs> Debs, could you come back on that, please, about the 99 and the 1% and the funding of artists? Yes. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, we are an arts organisation and the funding we receive is from the government, the public purse is actually very small. Um, and so uh, we have to be popular, <laughs> for want of a better phrase, we are popular and we have a million football and people come on site and things that make us money or people doing stuff. So I was just um, talking this morning, we have um, uh, inclusive dance, so we have wheelchair dance and we're just about to get that up and running again because it always sells out and it, and I said to my colleague, how did we ever come to do that? Because it's a fabulous idea, you know. And she said, oh, one of our, one of, uh, somebody rang in and said, could, could we, could they do something? They, they're in wheelchairs, so they want to be active. What can they do, which is different? So I think, again, it's, a, I'm trying to sort of be, I'm thinking both for Teresa and for Ashok here, that it is about listening again. And it's also about mixing up what people's expectations are in those public spaces and sites. And actually, again, it, for me, it's all about the experimentation. You know, nothing should be set. It might work, it may not work, um, but it has to be driven for me with an, with an interest that the public want to take part. And I'm not talking big numbers, you know, in the things that we do, but there has to be that sort of sense of, um, I suppose, enthusiasm and participation. Um, and we flex that. So, but it is interesting about people doing a lot more creativity during lockdown. I would absolutely agree with that. Our courses and classes have shot up. People are feeling that it helps them make sense of the world around them, their own creativity at the moment. And that's a very positive thing. Thank you. There's a question from uh, Lara Ratnaraja and that's about care and I would, Hopefully, Lara will be coming to the next one and deal with it in the next session. So just as a final question, I'm going to ask thanks so much for all your insight. This is from Leanne O'Connor. I was wondering how you can instigate long-term change when you're not in a management role. Changing programming aims, influence who you work with, etc. And we've just got, we've got very little time, so we can just have a, a quick answer from, from each of you, please. So instigating long-term change when you're not in a management role. Um, well, I think you just have to learn to lobby. Uh, I, I, you know, on a very basic level, when I was a curator, I used to leave 
little, all sorts of little notes and articles and all sorts of things. Homework, I used to call it, for my uh, bosses. <laughs> I used to leave it on their desk. I mean, on a very, very simple level. I think you can make change also through charm, you know, through trying to be really positively persuasive as well as sort of being, you know, there's many ways and it's your commitment to change has to be over that longer period yourself. And sometimes you have to appreciate that it won't happen immediately, but you're committed to the change yourself, if that makes sense. Thank you. Teresa? I just want to say that um, if you're not in a management role and you're not paid to do this work, just to be conscientious and considerate and care for yourself when you start taking on this kind of um, lobbying work, because it is a lot. And I think people do become exhausted and they become disenchanted with the possibility. And I think that for me, I'm, I'm in a lead position. That's what my role is. So I do, my mandate is I am employed to think about these things. And I have quite a lot of colleagues that say, say something and I say, look, I've been designated as the person to do this, bring things to me and I can lobby on your behalf because it's that proximity to power and it is power. So for me, I always think if there's somebody within that institution whose job is to ensure this is happening, then you should go to them with as much information that you want, but you should not take on work that you're not paid to do either. Because this is usually what happens, especially to us who are minoritized because of our lived experiences, right? we give so much free labor and I think I'm, I'm done giving free labor. This is why I get paid to do it now, so. Thank you. Ashok, do you have a final comment? You'll have to use your microphone. For me as an activist, it's more about um, necessity. I know that I can't get anywhere without actually shouting. And um, it's about encouraging vicariousness and, um trying to kind of get people to actually understand whether that's through metaphor or what you know whatever um understanding what you actually go through as an artist talking to other artists and kind of bringing their voice to the fore as well and um yeah i've done that mainly through writing and sharing that writing and not just writing it and kind of leaving it but actually kind of actively as uh, Deborah said, lobbying people and sending that article out to people and saying, look, read this. Thank you. And on that note, well, I'll bring things to a close. So I hope you've enjoyed the first event and thank you for coming and your questions. Um, please fill in the feedback form. That would be really helpful. A huge thanks to Deb, Ashok and Teresa. It's been absolutely fascinating and I wish we had far more than an hour. And, you know, there's been so much brought up. It's been amazing. Thank you very much. And what a privilege to listen to you all. Curating institutional change broadens the discourse around the lack of representation of disabled curators and progresses the conversations about inclusion, access and diversity beyond the traditional tropes. There are two more events in the series. There's on the, next week, we have Care and Compassion. And then on the 30th of June, we have Inside Outside, Creating Change from Within, and also the launch of the call out for the next round of curatorial commission hosts. The impact of this program on host organizations and for the deaf and disabled curators involved has been significant. And we now want to increase its reach by expanding the network of organizations. Curating institutional change events are made possible through Art Fund and Arts Council England. And I'd also like to just thank you once again to Nicola Dutton and Rachel Radford for signing and captioning. And thank you all very much for attending. And once again, thanks to a brilliant panel. Thank you. Thank you.